I have a great pleasure uh, to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, David Perkins, who's professor of teaching and learning emeritus at Harvard University, Harvard Graduate School of Education. He's a founding member of Harvard Project Zero. I would recommend you go to the website of Project Zero to see the extensive work that they've been doing for a very long time on education under the Graduate School of Education. His projects focus, his research focuses on a wide range of issues of vital relevance to this conference. Creativity, informal reasoning, problem solving, which we heard about from Winston, understanding individual, the individual, individuality, organizational learning, teaching, and thinking skills. Professor Perkins is one of the principal developers of Wide World Initiative. It's a wide-scale interactive development pro pro for educators, a distance learning model, which perhaps we'll hear something more about. He's the author of numerous books. I can't discuss them all, but you see a list of some of them here and his seven principles of learning uh, very prominently. Uh, with that, I would like to welcome and introduce our keynote, Professor Perkins. David? Our theme this morning is Educating for the Unknown, Reimagining Learning for a Changing World. And I'd like to dedicate this talk to the hand in the back of the room. Those of us who have been in education for a while will have met the hand in the room. Every now and then, especially in the younger years, there's the student in back who raises his hand or her hand and says, why do we have to learn this? <laughs> now, as students get older, for the most part, they get more polite, and one hears that question less. But I am convinced that that question is lurking there in the silence of those students in the back of the room, even at the university level. And from time to time as a university teacher, although I try to do my best to keep things interesting and relevant, from time to time, one of my university students even asks that kind of question in perhaps more graceful form. So this is dedicated to the hand in the back of the room. Why do we have to learn this? It's a question that's offensive to teachers because we all try hard. We all try to put out what seems valuable and worthwhile. And it's sometimes a misguided question because the student with the hand doesn't have enough perspective to recognize the value of what's on the table. But sometimes I have to say the question is all too valid. Sometimes there is in fact very little reason to learn what's being put forth. And it's that dilemma presented by the hand in the back of the room that I would like to speak to today. We face a complex world that's been mentioned a number of times. It's messy, it's disjointed. Uh, education can be out of alignment with the way things work in our current social, artistic, technical, and political realities. So the hand in the back of the room has something worth worrying about. Well, so, the fundamental question we want to explore this morning is, what's worth learning? What's really worth learning? What really informs and empowers and enlightens learners? That's the fundamental question, and I want to make you a promise right now. I'm not going to answer the question. I'm not going to answer the question because I don't think it has one single answer at all. What I'd like to address instead is the challenges of how to think well about the question, how to get some traction on it, how to find some direction, not so much what's the final answer, because there is none. 
Around this circle, you will see a little preview of some of the ideas, but let me give you a broad sketch. We'd like to spend a little time expanding on the notion of learning that matters, and then engage why it is such a tricky, challenging question in today's world. One way to try to assess what kind of learning truly matters is to tell stories to ourselves and tell stories to other, others about where a particular piece of learning might go in learners' lives. Looking ahead and sketching scenarios. That's a valuable test because when we do that, we find wonderful things and powerful things that we might teach and our students might learn. But we also find there are problem stories, elements of the curriculum that are typical and recur around the world, but really don't have much added value for most learners. There is what you might call a relevance gap throughout a great deal of education. And we need to bridge that relevance gap. Along the way, I'll share some tools that help us to think about that. And toward the end, another tool, the six beyond, six directions that I think are quite heartening in contemporary education that help with the quest. And then we'll come back to the theme, educating for the unknown for a brief close. So that's the master plan. And let's get started with learning that matters. Here's that complicated world again. And in that complicated world, live the next generation. Live the students who are growing up today, who are entering kindergarten, eighth grade, who are graduating, who are going on to higher education. And we have to ask, what is most valuable that as educators we can share with those students? <clears throat> what should we put forward? Well, of course, there are the standards, literacy and numeracy. And none of this puzzling about what's worth learning challenges the importance of literacy and numeracy in a fairly nimble, thoughtful form. Of course we want that. But what do we want beyond that? How important is it to learn the French Revolution? Or about the fundamental biological process of mitosis represented in this diagram? Or the nature and mechanisms of communicable diseases? Or the quadratic equation. Or statistics and probability. Or, 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 or. There are just endless things that can be and generally someplace are offered to our learners. But we have to ask, what of that learning matters? What matters in the lives learners are likely to live? That's the basic question. What kind of learning matters in the lives learners are likely to live? Notice what the question is not. It's not what learning matters in the grand scheme of all knowledge. What learning matters regarding the fundamentals of physics or the depths of literature? Some of that is surely part of what will matter to the lives learners will live, but not all of it. Some fundamentals are actually not so central to lives, although they may be fascinating and profoundly transformative for particular individuals seeking those directions. Learning that matters let that take us to the small world paradox. If you were living in 14th century France, you would be living in a much simpler world. About 90% of the population in such areas were farmers, lived on farms. 
what worlds would they know? They would know the world of the farm. They would know the world of the local village. And they would know the world of the church. And that's just about it. That's just about all for most of them. They would probably not be literate. And that makes things simpler too. <laughs> so it's church imagery, oral communication, in the local economy, and on the farm, and uh, in the cathedrals. Zooming ahead a few centuries, when I was growing up, I spent some of my time watching this program on TV. This program is called Gunsmoke, and it's a classic Western of American culture. And I watched a lot of other things like that. And in many ways, my world was much more connected by far because I had the local library. I had a whole four TV channels. Think of it, four television channels. I had newspapers and so on. I was certainly much more connected than our farmer in 14th century France. But let's update until today. We li live in an amazingly connected media world. We have the internet. We have hundreds of television channels in many settings. We have our cell phones. Not only that, but world transportation has become so efficient that one can get almost any place in the world that's a major site in 24 hours often much less. We live in an amazingly connected world, and that brings a profound level of complexity and uncertainty into our lives. I like to call it the small world paradox. Here's the small world paradox. As our collective world gets smaller, you know the saying, it's a small world. <laughs> As our collective world gets smaller, the worlds we individually engage become more numerous and complex. You would think having access to everything would kind of create a holistic sense of how we relate to one another and how knit together the human condition is. Actually, sometimes it does that for some people, but many times it seems to create fractionation, factionalization. Individuals shooting off in all sorts of different directions, forming special interest groups, sometimes terrorist groups. It's messy. It's the small world paradox. And this is the world in which we have to teach young people. And this is the world in which we have to ask the question, what's worth learning? What learning matters for them? in the midst of this tangle. That's the small world paradox. And it defines the puzzle of today's education in ways that I think go well beyond the gun smoke I used to watch and far beyond 14th century France. So how can we think about this messy situation? Well, one way one might explore the dilemmas of education is through what we might call opportunity stories. Opportunity stories are stories about where a particular piece of learning, a particular theme, a particular topic might go in learners' lives. And actually, the easiest way to seek opportunity stories is to look to the past rather than the future. Then one gets a feel for what they're like and therefore what we might look toward as we plan the future of education. So for a number of years, I've collected opportunity stories by talking to various individuals. And I've asked this kind of question. When you were young, when you were in elementary school, when you were in high school and so forth, what did you learn that really stuck with you and proved valuable in your life? 
One of the interesting things about this question is some of the time a person can't seem to think of much. <laughs> oh yes, they say, well, numeracy and literacy. Everybody says that. But beyond that, when we talk about themes such as, oh, communicable diseases of the French Revolution, some people say, well, I don't know. <laughs> but other people have wonderful stories to tell, opportunity stories in retrospect, looking backward. I've collected a number of these, but I'm just going to share a couple of favorites with you. His favorite, uh, his favorite number one. Yes, somebody said the French Revolution. I thought that was wonderful and I was quite surprised. If you had asked me what did I learn about when I was in elementary school or high school that really stuck with me and proved valuable in my life, I would not have said the French Revolution. But this person did. And what was important was what the person explained about why. Let me share that with you. He said, through the French Revolution, I was able to understand the generalities of world conflict. For instance, how the lack of freedoms, poverty, overtaxation, weak economics, the struggle between the church and the state, or social inequity has always been a reason to engage in war. And I should add that that's not all he said. He went on to elaborate this a good deal. It became plain that it wasn't so much the facts of the French Revolution that this person's teacher had put on offer, but a kind of a big picture historical perspective on the French Revolution and its analogies with other kinds of situations. So the French Revolution is a candidate here, at least if it's taught that way. Here's another answer I thought was interesting. Another person I talked to said, narrative. Narrative is an interesting kind of response because narrative is a fundamental thread in all world civilizations. There is no world civilization without the story. And again, this person offered an explanation. This person had had a teacher that offered an expansive view of the concept of narrative. And through that, this person said, I came to understand that narratives are helpful in thinking about our world. They give us a way of coding things. Nuances will inevitably emerge which may challenge our narratives. So narratives are not supposed to be sealed systems. If we do decide to believe in a narrative, we had better be ready, willing, and able to defend it. The dialectic of defense and challenge through narratives. And while narratives have unmistakable allure, it is crucial to never overlook evidence that will support a contrary position just because it is easier to maintain than an original one. I'm sure what comes to mind here, for one thing, is the arena of politics, where many politicians basically offer their narratives in a sealed way as things not to be challenged and encourage their wholehearted embrace in ways that are really profoundly distorting of the human condition. So this was another theme that struck me as a theme with a good opportunity story in retrospect and in prospect, because it's easy to see how this powerful idea could become a lens through which to engage many complexities of that messy world. So we have the French Revolution, we have narrative, but the good thing about our current world situation is that there are endless rich themes that invite expansive treatment that would be truly enlightening and empowering. I'll just toss a few on the table. For instance, there's global warming. Or there's poverty. In the scene on the left, you see a barrio of poor. And on the right, this sort of super residential uh, area, a high-rise building. Or, of course, terrorism. 
which although it's much on our minds today, has actually quite a long history. Or the media world again, its complexities, its uncertainties, what can you rely on, uh, questions like that. Or genetic engineering. Will we have designer babies soon? Do we want designer babies soon? What about genetically engineered crops? Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Why? Why not? What are the dangers? What are the benefits? Do we want to resurrect the dinosaurs? Or at least the mammoths? We might be able to. Genetic engineering. Or 21st century skills, as they're often called. Skills like critical and creative thinking, uh, civic skills, skills of civic engagement, skills of entrepreneurship, and so forth. This theme is a part of many educational frameworks around the world. All of these seem to have an obvious high relevance. Just intuitively, it seems clear that one could take any of these and tell a rich opportunity story about how knowledge and understanding of that theme might move forward in a person's life. <clears throat> but how can we test such stories? What do they offer? Well, let me suggest that there are at least four criteria that are helpful for sizing up the potential of a theme, like, say, global warming or the French Revolution or um, narrative. Insight, action, ethics, and opportunity. If you have a good theme, let's say the theme of poverty, it gives you insight into the way the world works. It offers actions that you might take in the world. Let's say supporting policies designed to do something about world poverty or simply donating. It has an ethical side to it clearly the case with the theme of poverty and opportunity. It's something that comes up with some frequency, not once every 10 years, not once a year, but in the case of poverty, all too often. Insight, action, ethics, and opportunity, those are tests for a good opportunity story and a good theme just based on this collection and these observations and thinking about a number of cases. So for instance, let's test out these criteria on 21st century skills. Well, this is an easy one, isn't, isn't it? 21st century skills gives us insights into the dynamics of thinking, human relations, civic responsibility, and so forth. It gives us things to do in the world. We can think with these tools and we can engage our uh, family and our community more deeply and subtly with these tools. There is certainly an ethical side to it, a side of responsible behavior and many opportunities. That's an easy one. Also an easy one is global warming, all too much in our faces these days. What might seem tricky is a theme like the French Revolution. Certainly, it would have been tricky for me before I heard from the person I interviewed. Because the way I learned the French Revolution, yeah, I got some insights into the dynamics of it, but it wasn't framed in a way that I could do much with those insights. The ethics seemed long ago and far away. And it just didn't come up that much. But we have to recognize that the person I told you about learned about the French Revolution in a very different way, in a much richer, more expansive, more connected way. And that's what made the difference. It's not just the name of the topic, French Revolution. It's what's made of the topic. I like to call these kinds of understandings big understandings. Big to imply their stretchiness, their expanse, the way they reach out into other parts of the human condition. And here's a little tool I'd just like to share with you for a moment. Uh, the name of this tool is Mattermatics. It's a pun. I'm sorry, it only works in English, but it means uh, the mathematics of learning that matters. <laughs> That's the sense of it. 
And here's the tool, plus one times two divide by three. Plus one, if you were teaching or planning an educational program, what's one topic or theme that usually isn't taught that you might like to put in? Something that isn't typically taught in your context that you would like to add. Times two, what's one topic that is taught but you would like to treat more expansively or see treated more expansively? Maybe it's the French Revolution. <laughs> and divide by three to make room, what's something you would shrink? Plus one times two, divide by three. I just want to give you one minute to speculate about that. Talk with a neighbor if you want to, but just what would, shooting from the hip like gun smoke, very quickly, what would be a plus one for you? Or a times two for you, or a divide by three for you? Please go ahead and do that, take the minute. Okay, thank you very much. Let's come back together. You'll see mathematics a couple of more times before we're done. But let's go on now. By the way, the point of this is not as a comprehensive curriculum planning tool. It's what in idiomatic English we would call an icebreaker, a little thing you can do to sort of get your head going. Um, So we've explored a little bit the notion of opportunity stories, the way one can tell a story about where some theme or topic might go in learners' lives and gauge the strength of that story with themes in mind like inside action, ethics, and opportunity. Let's turn from there to the dark side of the force, problem stories. <laughs> Let's turn to mitosis. This is a um, microscopic stain photograph of the process of mitosis, which in case you've forgotten, I hope you haven't forgotten, is the process of asexual cell division. And make no mistake about it, it is a tremendously important biological process. Tremendously important. Now, as sometimes taught, and it is taught in many cultures as part of many curricula around the world, as sometimes taught, it's offered in a purely informational way. You will learn about interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and everybody's favorite, cytokinesis. These are the stages of this rather complex process, mitosis, and sometimes students are asked to learn the definitions and the words. Now, this is not the kind of education any of us is interested in. It's fairly meaningless knowledge, but it can be done much better. I know about cases where the process of mitosis is explored with much more depth. One especially provocative approach I ran across is the mitosis dance. There is an approach that some teachers use where you ask groups of students to play the various parts of the cell and design a choreography that plays out the stages of mitosis and reveals their functional significance by the way cellular and DNA elements connect with one another and disconnect with one another. 
So it can be done with much more depth. And if anything, we want to be talking about the deeper per approaches, the approaches that do cultivate an understanding of mitosis. But in this context, we have to be asking, what's the opportunity story? What's the opportunity story? Let's go back to those four criteria and think forward in students' lives. Criteria number one is insight. And I want to be very clear, yes, if well taught, the story of mitosis is a story of insight. It is fundamentally revealing about aspects of the biological world. Yes, for insight. Action, not so much. When I stroll through my day, I don't find it very generative to ask myself, let's see, do I see mitosis around here? Ethics, not so much. Opportunity, not so much. It just doesn't come up that much. And when it does, it's in roundabout or particular ways that don't require a deep understanding of mitosis, just the gist of the idea. Now, maybe you find that convincing, maybe not. Some biology teachers will argue about this. They will say, well, maybe this, maybe that. Maybe they're right. I'll come back to that. But at least at first glance, mitosis doesn't have a very good opportunity story. Not for any lack of insight, but because of the way the concept plays out in the larger ecology of lives, knowledge, news, conversation, medical challenges, and so forth and so on that we face. Compare it with something like communicable diseases. Let's consider those same criteria applied to this mosquito or any mechanism of disease communication. Insight, yes, there's plenty to be learned about fundamental biological phenomena in the context of communicable diseases. Lots of fundamental insight to be attained. Action in the world, you bet, there's plenty of action to be taken. Action all the way from supporting certain kinds of health policies uh, to personal actions, such as wearing a face mask, uh, or such as using gloves under certain circumstances, or such as cleanly surgical practices, and so on. Plenty of action to be taken that is underwritten by such understandings. Uh, ethics, absolutely. A very important ethical dimension and indeed ethical dilemmas. For instance, what should be the state's power um, to isolate people that have a communicable disease? That's a tricky ethical issue. Uh, or should the state be allowed to force inoculation? And when and why? Not to mention one's personal ethical conduct in the context of whatever malady one may have. And opportunity, sadly, <laughs> it's a theme that comes up all the time. There always seems to be something new and dreadful in the news some newly emergent virus or other affliction, like Zika, for example. Or the quadratic equation. Now, sometimes teachers of math get mad when I complain about the quadratic equation. <laughs> and in fact, I should tell you, my degrees are in mathematics. <laughs> Uh, and I love the quadratic equation. <laughs> this is super interesting, and I loved all that algebra stuff and so on. This insight of a certain kind to be had there. This is not about the insight. This is about the bigger picture. Let's do a little experiment. This is, this is fun. How many people in this room studied the quadratic equation at some point? Look around and see the hands. Okay. How many people have used a quadratic equation in the last 10 years? There are a few hands. How many people have used a quadratic equation in the last 10 years outside of an educational context? 
Ah, we have a couple of hands there. Cool. One there. Excellent. Excellent. But you get the point. <laughs> For most people, it's not something that thrives in their lives. Now, let's ask the same question about basic statistics and probability. We're not talking about multilinear regression or anything like that, factor analysis or anything like that. Just the basic stuff, how probabilities work, how, what it means to have a mean of something or a standard deviation, some sense of that. How many people in your formal education at some point studied basic statistics and probability? Good show. Good showing. How many people have used basic statistics and probability at some level in the last 10 years? Well, look at the hands. What about in the last year? Most of the hands are still up. What about in the last month? Oh, a couple of hands going down, but there's still more than half the room with their hands up. So if I'm an educational planner, where am I going to invest my valuable educational time and my students' valuable educational time in quadratic equations or in basic statistics and probability. Okay, you might say both, fine, you can say both, but what else is in the competition? How are the choices made? I mentioned before that the French Revolution is kind of a puzzle case here because it's not so obviously a generous offering to the future of learners but this is a crucial distinction, I think, for us. Understanding of versus understanding with. When we teach for understanding, I hope we always try to teach for understanding of the topic. A real understanding of the French Revolution, the causal dynamics, the puzzles, the pivotal point in history, and so on. But it's clear from the example I gave you earlier that that wasn't where that learner's learning stopped. It was a more expansive treatment of the French Revolution that treated the French Revolution not only for its own sake, but as a lens, as a lens onto a larger, more complex political world. So sometimes the topic, just as a topic, is not automatically rich and widely connected, but it can be treated that way by teaching it as a lens, understanding of to understanding with. What about mitosis? <clears throat> Sometimes people say, well, you can do the same thing with mitosis. You can teach it for understanding of, a genuine understanding of, it, but you can treat it much more expansively for understanding with. And I've heard a couple of people give explanations of what that might look like. I, I don't find them very convincing, to tell you the truth. Maybe, um, but uh, when you start with something like communicable diseases, it's a lot easier. <laughs> However, that's just my off-the-cuff answer. The point is the quest. The point is the reach. The point is to reach after an expansive treatment and see if you can get there. So all honor goes to the biology teacher who figures out how to do that. And maybe mitosis can be a big understanding with just the right approach. Here's mathematics again. Plus one times two divide by three. Plus one, what's one idea, theme, topic that's not usually taught that you might add times two What's one you might stretch, treat expansively, convert from understanding of to understanding with? Divide by three, what's something you would shrink? And I'd like to invite you to spend one minute on divide by three. What is something that you would shrink or even drop if you were a teacher or you were designing a curriculum? That's the hard one. It's much easier to add or imagine what you would add than to subtract, than to divide. Please take a minute and think about whether you can identify something you would drop or shrink.
Thank you. Let's go on. We've been exploring the challenge of problem stories, topics and themes that don't have such good opportunity stories. And sad to say, there are many problem stories in the typical curriculum. Why? What forces keep these rather tired problem stories in place? That brings us to the theme of the relevance gap. This is a diagram of the Little Dipper. At the tip of the handle of the Little Dipper is the North Star. The North Star gives us direction. We can chart our course by the North Star, and we all need to be asking today, what is our North Star for education? One popular North Star over the past couple of decades has been what's usually called the achievement gap. The problem is, that many students are not achieving what we would like them to. They're not achieving levels that are deemed competent, at least. And there's another layer to the problem that sometimes these gaps line up along the fissures of various ethnic groups. So some ethnic groups systematically don't achieve as well as others. And that's another meaning of the achievement gap. Enormous investment and energy and research has been invested in closing the achievement gap. Now let me be clear. I'm not saying that the achievement gap is an unimportant problem. It is an important problem, a tremendously important problem. But in some quarters, looking at government funding priorities, looking at projects and so forth, you would think it's the only problem in education. I don't think it's the only problem in education. In fact, there's another gap, the relevance gap. To what extent does what's on offer speak to the lives the students are likely to live? Remember the hand in the back of the room. Why do we have to learn this? In other words, actually, some of those students with their hands up are right. No wonder they're not achieving so much they don't see themselves as engaged in something worth achieving. I would suggest that at least some of the achievement gap reflects the perceptions of learners about what's worth learning. Certainly not all of it at all, but some of it. So let's at least put side by side with the achievement gap, the relevance gap as something that desperately needs attention. Another North Star for education has long been information. Forget about this fancy understanding stuff. At least we would like our students to emerge from their basic educations with a lot of information. And there is a lot to have information about, especially in this paradoxically small world. Here's a little sample. You might have information about Oh, technologies, this weird gadget, long division, the uh, graphics of hokusai, uh, dollars, euros, pounds, yen, 206 bones in the adult human body, the Big Bang, 3 times 7 is 21, to be or not to be equals mc squared, omnia gallias divisa in partes tres, uh, Luther and the Reformation, uh, the Italian Renaissance, 1492, 1066, and so on, and so on, and so on. If this screen were the width of Italy, <laughs> you wouldn't run out of space. <laughs> well, again, as with the achievement gap, don't get me wrong. It's good to have information. I like to have information. You like to have information. It's good to have a fair bit of that. I'm not challenging that. But we also need to remember that in this media rich world, the place of information and its availability has changed a good deal, and that's often been noted. Nowadays, you can find out almost any well-known basic piece of information very quickly by Googling it, or going to Wikipedia, or whatever. I've actually, just personally and for fun, done some experiments like this, picked random topics and timed how fast it took me to find 
the piece of information on Google, generally less than a minute. Now, from the standpoint of cognitive processing, less than a minute is not enough for many kinds of thinking. There's some kinds of thinking you want the information right there immediately for. But for many kinds of information, one minute is fine. In fact, one minute is great, or 10, or 20, or whatever. In an information-rich world where everybody, or many people at least in reasonably affluent contexts or even semi-affluent contexts have very quick information access, the place of information has been somewhat demoted. Pumping students full of information no longer makes as much sense as it used to. The North Star has changed a bit. Let me turn to one more, expertise. And uh, this is different, interesting, I think, because who would want to argue with expertise? Well, it's a little tricky. We have to look here at the structure of curricula. How coursework is typically organized. If we take a discipline like, say, mathematics or history, what pre-university teachers typically like to do is encourage their students, especially the best students, to reach toward the sophisticated layers of the discipline. Uh, if I'm a math teacher, I want my students to be taking AP calculus or something like that. <laughs> I want that advancement. And I treasure the thought that some of those might actually become mathematicians. Ooh, nice. I've done my job. I've um, been fruitful and multiplied my mathematical interests into the larger society. And hey, I was that kind of student, and I think that kind of thing is fun and interesting and so forth and so on. But it implies a structuring of disciplinary learning that looks inward that looks inward to the particulars of the discipline and the nuances of the discipline, that absolutely gets quadratic equations in there and well beyond quadratic equations. Contrast that with another way of organizing disciplinary learning. You'll notice that here around the lens, the arrows go outward. The discipline is taught deeply, not so much for its own sake, for its nuances, for its particulars, for its technical details, as for the way it connects with a larger world. Discipline, that's the way the French Revolution might typically be taught, but the outreaching version of the French Revolution that we've celebrated, that's what you might call expert amateurism. I recognize that's a paradoxical phrase. The idea is that one is becoming very good at a not super technical version of knowledge in the domain. One is becoming very good at, for instance, basic statistics and probability. Not the fancy stuff, but very good at the basics so one can make sense of the world around one. One reason expert amateurism is important is that research on cognitive development and students shows that the rush to expertise often doesn't work. You find students who are very good at a technical topic, like let's say physics, but then you give them qualitative physics problems and you find that actually they're quite confused about what their physics really means, even though they can do the math and solve the problems at the end of the chapter. So, Expertise in the sense of real understanding is something of a delusion in most settings. Not necessarily a good investment for most students. What does X mean? So these temptations, these temptations toward the uh, achievement gap, toward information, and toward expertise, are not reliable North Stars. They're not to be dismissed. They're not without some importance. But we need a larger, more expansive, more perspectival stance toward the way education works and how it might serve learners. 
One help toward that course comes simply from charting what people around the world are doing. And I find this quite exciting. Uh, a few years ago, colleagues and I did a kind of a survey. We looked at different frameworks, at schools, at uh, within various nations, and so on. And we were able to detect emerging trends. And we like to call these trends the six beyonds. So one way to chart toward a better North Star is to bear what's happening, bear in mind what's happening around the world. Here are our six trends. Beyond content, we see a strong motion toward not just content, like the French Revolution or quadratic equations or whatever, but 21st century skills, digital competencies, citizenship competencies, and so forth. Beyond content. Beyond local, an emphasis on global perspectives, global problems, and global understandings. That's a good thing. Beyond topics, this brings back into play this contrast between understanding of versus understanding with. Treating topics as lenses on the larger world, not just for understanding them in themselves. Beyond the traditional disciplines, we see sometimes injected into the typical pantheon of the disciplines, less expected ones, like, let's say, philosophy, philosophy for children, very provocative, or linguistics, or studies of peace and war and human nature as uh, in the uh, Facing History and Ourselves curriculum, for those of you who know about that. That's exciting to step beyond those traditional disciplines. Beyond discrete disciplines, interdisciplinary topics and problems. And an interesting one, beyond academic engagement. Much more room for personal choice, significance, commitment, and passion. For instance, in some settings, students get out into the community and address community problems with an academic turn to their understanding, but also with an action orientation toward doing something about them. These beyonds help point a kind of direction. One example of this is the European reference framework that I'm sure many of you know about, which includes themes like communication in the mother tongue, foreign languages, mathematical competence, digital competence, learning to learn, and so on. These are good things. And it's the European reference framework and a couple of dozen others from which we did this synthesis. These are good things and heartening. One does have to ask, though, is there a right framework, one that is the North Star? Is it the European reference framework? There are good frameworks in Australia. There are good frameworks in certain states in the United States, and so on. But I think I've already telegraphed my answer to that. I don't think there's a perfect framework. There are choices to be made. There's not enough room. And different populations in the world have different kinds of needs. So I don't think there's a answer. But the question and the pursuit of the question is tremendously important. So here once more is mathematics, and I'd like you to take one minute to look at the six beyonds and just ask yourself, if I could do anything I wanted, which one of these beyonds would I push? Which is my plus one and my times two that I think is most needed right now in my context? Go ahead and take the minute.
Thank you. And let me bring this now to a close. We turn back to our original title, Educating for the Unknown. We begin with the hand in the back of the room, asking that annoying but important question, why do we have to learn this? We began by recognizing how the world today, with its small world paradox, poses profound puzzles for the character and direction of education. As our collective world gets smaller, the worlds we individually engage become more numerous and complex. We have to ask ourselves what kind of education truly makes sense for today's youth, truly informs and prepares and energizes them for this messy world. One answer to that is to construct frameworks, like the European framework or many others. And that's a part of the solution. In local contexts and national contexts, one needs some kind of a framework to work with, preferably one that's not so rigid, but some kind of a framework to work with. That's fine, so long as we don't delude ourselves into thinking that there is one right framework, if only we could find it. But what I've tried to put in the foreground over these few minutes is not the quest for the right framework, but the quest for ways of thinking about the challenge. Ways that ask, can we tell good opportunity stories? Can we tell stories rich with insight, action, ethics, and opportunity? Can we pursue the six beyonds? Can we use that little tool, mathematics, to sort of get a foot in the door of the rich possibilities. When I think about the state of education today, it takes me back to this provocative work of art by Hakuin Ekaku. Take a look, please. It's called Two Blind Men Crossing a Log. There's the log, there's the blind man. It's a Buddhist work. It's about the quest for enlightenment. And its basic message in the Buddhist context, of course, is that the quest for enlightenment is a process of groping. But I think it fits wonderfully well our context of educating for the unknown. As educators, we do not know exactly where the world is going. We do not know exactly what our students' lives would be like. We have to grope. We have to stumble occasionally. But we want to do our best to travel along the log. And what I think is wonderful about this is you notice what the two blind men are not doing. They're not just merrily strolling out onto the log and hoping the log stays under their feet. They're groping their way smart. They have their canes out. They're feeling for where the log is. And as educators, I think that's what we have to do every day. We need to face the challenge of educating for the unknown and feel our way into it in ways that are fruitful for today's world. Thank you. When we conceived of this morning's session, we really conceived of this as kind of the prelude to our serious exploration of the future education. We wanted and hoped that a lot of profound questions would be raised to, give a, to make us all think freshly about what we're going to do with education in the future. And uh, Professor Perkins, we really have to thank you for asking wonderful questions, making us all think. Uh, and it's our job in the next two and a half days to contemplate these questions in many different contexts and see where we end up on Saturday afternoon. So thank you very much. <laughs>